Hey, what's up, players? WWE Hall of Famer Teddy Long, and I just want everybody to know that you're listening to Tory Talks Wrestling. And if you don't listen to it, then it's one on one with The Undertaker. <laughs> Welcome to Tori Talks Wrestling. On today's episode, we have a very special guest with us. That is Tony Snow, who is our favorite indie manager ever. So, yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs> ever, us. man. I got a big, man, how am I going to fit into those shoes? What an intro, Tori. I need to take you with me everywhere. I wish all these other sweat hogs in the crowd appreciated my craft as much as you do, man. Seriously. <laughs> but thank you so much for having me on today. And you know what, Tori? Since you brought up that I'm your favorite indie manager, you're one of my favorite fans. You and two or three other people that actually um, cheer for me and appreciate uh, the the words of the great Jesse Ventura, who always told us, win if you can, lose if you must, but always cheat. <laughs> well, we, now we need to know who these other two fans are so we can go break their kneecaps. <laughs> I know, right? Well, one is from WFC, and then another one is from... Uh, is from uh, MPX. And the one at WFC, she's a little girl, so y'all might have an even fight. But the one at MPX, he's like a 50-year-old hockey player, so he might try some dirty stuff. <laughs> Tori will run over their toes. So yep. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, she'll just, run, she'll just run them over with the gun. With the, <laughs> that's great. And I'll tell you guys, since I've gotten that shirt you sent me, I have gotten so many compliments on it. I've got, I got the old school design one. Where the superplex and Tori's there all excited. Like I've gotten so many, so many compliments on that. So I do have some stuff I'm getting ready for you, Tori. I'm just waiting because my merch guy is Sam Stackhouse. And I'm gonna be followed everything, but he's in the hospital right now. He's not doing that great. Mm. And he had a whole thing of stickers and money stickers and beanies and shirts for me and everything. And then like when he was supposed to send it, something happened. I don't know. So um, hopefully in the next week or two, he'll be home and we'll be able to get something out to you. But I got plenty of swag for you and your mom, even something for your dad thrown in there, too. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. We'll see if we'll give it to him. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe if he's nice. Yeah. Maybe I'll well, send some brass nuts and you can be like, hey, this is from Tony, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so my first question was just going to be a, pretty much just a basic introduction to be Pretty much, just tell me just a little bit about yourself. Okay, it's simple. Um, I'm 42 years old. Um, I'm special needs. I was born nonverbal. I have autism. I'm on about four different medications a day that I take. And so the fact that um, I couldn't even speak until I'm six, and now I make a living, you know, as a manager talking on the microphone and, you know, speaking with lovely interviewers like yourself and whatnot and it's all because of wrestling like i had some very dedicated grandparents who didn't give up and they spent a lot of money on taking me to speech therapy and things like that as a child and i just wasn't getting any of it i just it was like none of it was working but you know it worked wrestling worked when i was a kid wcw and jim crockett promotions and gwf um those were what i watched all the time after school gwf was on espn which it's funny because gwf was based out of the sportatorium in dallas and now i work with the referee who ref all those matches on a very you know consistent basis james beard he was actually uh just in the iron claw movie he was the referee in all those wrestling scenes so um, it's crazy how things come full circle. I was watching him on TV when I was six and now I'm 42 and I'm working with him. But I learned how to speak from the commentary on the wrestling shows from Jim Ross and Tony Schiavone on WCW. Like they would say something and I would repeat it. And so I couldn't say I couldn't carry on a simple conversation, but I could say stuff like suplex and slobber knocker and things like that, you know. And um and it's, you know, it's crazy. I met Jim Ross once and I told him the story and he cried and gave me a hug. And I just, uh, if I ever meet Tony Schiavone, I'll tell him thank you as well. But that's how I got into it. It was like the only thing that made sense to me as a kid. Like my my oldest memory ever was from WrestleMania 2 when Hulk Hogan and King Kong Bundy wrestled each other in the big blue cage and I was sitting on my granddad's lap. So like in my life, wrestling has always been the one constant thing and 
I knew that I'd never be able to actually wrestle, so I wanted to try to do the second best thing that I could do. And um, so I did. I had like a 20-year career as a DJ, and I turned that into working in production and wrestling. Um, I got a job working for a company called SWE, and that's where I met Teddy at. And that was one of my first real gigs working um, music for wrestling, where I was actually producing the entrance themes for the people and and uh, showing up at the show and hitting play for them to come out. And, you know, that was great. Just my my five year production career that I had. I started my own production company and. I had everything from lights and smoke machines. I had everything except for the ring to put on a wrestling show. And I thought, if this is the farthest that I'm ever going to get in wrestling, then I'm happy because I get to be behind the scenes. I get to meet people. You know, that's when I met Teddy Long for the first time. That's when I met Kevin Sullivan and he gave me these brass knuckles all those years ago. And... um so I just kept working and went from one company to another. I did a loop with Ring of Honor and got to know the Young Bucks really well and Cody and all of them. And it was crazy because at the time I was living in Denton, Texas, and Cody had a house that was about 10 minutes away from mine. And we would go to the same cigar lounge called Senior Frogs. And he let Brandy would let him invite all of us over. We'd come over and watch football and everything. And then one day... The guy who owned the place just showed up unannounced and ruined it for the rest of us. <laughs> we couldn't come over anymore. Um, but yeah, I just I worked production and then Teddy gave me a chance. He's like, hey, you know, you can talk and you've got this swagger and attitude about you. You might be too old to wrestle, but you could manage. And um, I was 260 pounds, and so Teddy got me into the gym and got the weight off of me first. That was the first key. I had to prove to him that I was serious about it by getting in shape. And so I went from 260 to 185. Um, and at that point, Teddy knew I was serious and hit the ground running, man, and haven't looked back since. And there you go, Tori. There's a Cliff Note story. Well, that was pretty cool that we did this interview actually in Autism Awareness Month, too. So, exactly, yeah. yes, right at the end of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, shout out to all my autistic fans watching, comment, and just talk about your experience with wrestling, too. But Yeah, would, that's, uh, that's how I got in the door with Ring of Honor was with that side. I was... Um, I had a, a little nonprofit I put together called Wrestling Against Autism, where I got a bunch of autistic kids together and we go to WrestleMania. And um, that's how I met some executives at ROH. And, and yeah, so uh, autism is one of those things where when I was a kid, no one really knew much about it. So it was kind of a stigma associated with it. You didn't want to really tell anybody you had it because it was treated as almost like a disease instead of a developmental disorder. But um, like in the 80s, when I was dealing with it, when I was young, it was like one in every couple hundred kids were diagnosed. And now it's one in every 62. And so the same amount of kids have autism. It's just now um, the medical society is catching up with it and there's different ways to screen people and test people and things like that they didn't have when i was a kid so um so yeah definitely so what made you decide to go into the wrestling industry i was just a fan it was one of the only things that ever made sense um you know i just i loved when it came down to it you know i loved how Almost every match, and there's a couple that are different ones, but almost every match is brings it back to like the most primal um, battle you can think of, and that's the battle between good and evil. And whether you cheer for the good guy or whether you cheer for the bad guy, you get invested in it. And it's there's something about wrestling, if you know. If, we just had one of, if not the greatest WrestleMania in history. And 
the last 10 minutes of that main event on the second day, that brought so many people back to wrestling. There's people that are watching wrestling again now because The Rock came back and because they heard The Undertaker was at WrestleMania and because they heard John Cena got involved. And so it's just, I'm really fortunate in that I always wanted to do this and now it's the best time to be involved in it because wrestling is cool again. You know, for a while, especially when I was a kid, all that was around was WWF back then and WCW. And if you were a wrestling fan, you were looked at as kind of like a nerd, you know, like the jocks picked on you and everything. And and it's funny because I, I went back in 2020 during the pandemic and I looked up a bunch of my old friends I went to school with. And a lot of those same jocks that bullied me and picked on me when I was a kid and said I would never amount to nothing, they're still stuck in my little hometown back in Virginia you know, working at the quickie stop and I'm on TV doing stuff I never believed I'd do. So I think I won that one. I'm just saying. Um, my yeah. point is, don't ever let your haters uh, bring you down. Like DDP during his induction speech, he said something that I'll never forget. He said, never believe or never... Never forget the power you give yourself by believing in yourself, but never forget the power you give someone else by believing in them. And so once I realized I can do it, anyone can do it, man. I mean, anyone can do it. I don't know if you've noticed, Tori, but there's actually been a young gentleman in a wheelchair that's been managing at GCW events. He just had a feud with Joey Janela. He ran into him with his motorized wheelchair. You know what I mean? Like, you can do whatever you want to do in life. And if somebody tells you you can't do it, then they're not the type of people that need to be around you. Mm -hmm. So is there anyone that you want to give a shout out to that helped you get started in the business? Oh, yeah. You know, of course, I got to give Teddy Long a shout out. He's my he's my father figure, my mentor. He's the one that told me I could do this and pushed me along the way. But there have also been a lot of other people. Um, my in-ring trainer, Coyote, he's an Oklahoma wrestling legend. And he's the one that taught me how to take all these crazy bumps I've been taking and stuff. Man, Tori, I took a bump from the apron of a six-foot ring onto a concrete floor a few weeks ago. And that was not fun, but it got a huge pop from the crowd, so it was worth it. <laughs> and, and because of Joe, I am completely fine after taking it. So I got to shout out my trainers. And then um, here recently, I've been getting a, a lot of FaceTime and been getting really close with D'Lo Brown. And he's been able to help me out a lot with just a lot of little things in the in the wrestling business, how to take things that I'm already doing and add things to it or change it a little bit, you know, make it a little bit more refined and believable. Because we're already, you know, we're already asking people to suspend disbelief to watch this wrestling match. I don't want to insult their intelligence while I'm at it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I want everything that I do in that ring to be 100% on point and on and on spot and believable. And um and if I could use your platform really, really quickly to relay a message from all professional managers to all wrestling fans in the crowd, especially the ones that sit in the front row, please, please stop telling us to get out of your way. OK, because, listen, when whenever we're out there working a wrestling match, we are where we're supposed to be every second of that match. At least I am. It's a it's it's it's. Pro wrestling at its core is simulated combat with a predetermined outcome, but it's literally like a live action movie, but only with one take. We don't get to mess up. If we mess up, then someone could die. And so I'm out here with all of these things in my head, things that I've got to do. Thing, I've got to be here. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to be ready for this. And when I've got, you know, Esther with the blue hair behind me yelling at me to get out of her way because she spent $12 to get into the building. No, Esther, people's lives are on the line. You can shut up because your mouth smells like douche water and I'm going to do my job. OK, 
and then we'll just get on from there. Like, that's the thing that I wish fans would understand. My job is to entertain you and make you feel something. Your job is to feel something and be entertained and sit there. This 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 show isn't, you know, WFC featuring Edna, or this show isn't, you know, MPX Wrestling featuring George the Mechanic. Like, you're not part of this show, even though you so badly want to be. Um, I just, it's it's crazy the 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 lengths that some of these fans will go to. I've had fans that have been waiting for me out by my car after the show, wanting to lay hands on me. I. I got slapped by a woman over the rail back in December. Someone who doesn't even know me laid hands on me. And I'm just like, dude, are you guys going to go to a movie? And if you don't like it, you're going to track the director down? Like, the, the only difference between what we do and what you see on a movie screen is we don't roll credits at the end of it. And we don't use stuntmen. The guys are the stuntmen. You know, I, back when I was calling commentary... I saw a guy do a moonsault, a springboard moonsault in the corner, a split like our Rob Van Dam used to do, where he jumped up and his top legs, he'd do a split, they'd hit the rope and he'd do a moonsault. Well, when his legs hit the rope, the rope broke and he landed on the back of his neck and he didn't move. Like, and thankfully he survived, he didn't break anything, but. It could have been a lot worse. And um, and so, yeah, what we do, guys, there's, there's, you know, we, we call calling wrestling fake. We call it using the F word because there's nothing fake about what we do. I'm just coming back from three weeks off because I had a torn muscle in my back and a concussion. I got the Jason Silver Memorial Show. And um, and there's, there's nothing fake about that. You know, these guys... You can talk to guys like um, Tyson Kidd, who had to retire at the peak of his career. He'll tell you there's nothing nothing fake about wrestling. Um, Mick Foley, who's three inches shorter than he was when he was 21 because his body's compacted from all of the punishment he put through it. They'll tell you. I mean, this is this is real sports, and people really get hurt. I mean, I'm a manager, and I'm getting hurt. What does that tell you? Yeah. It's just crazy the amount of things that fans do that's just insane like even the things that we've seen in person we've been to one show where a lady got up and slapped a guy and during the same match that some old dude was yelling racial slurs and it's like just crazy yeah you know luckily the place that i got slapped at the security lady was on the or the security was on the lady right away and um and as they were removing her from the building, I got her attention and then slapped the baby face and told her, told her it was for her. Uh, <laughs> and I'll, I slapped him as hard as I could. I had to apologize afterwards. <laughs> I got, I laid into him because, man, she got me heated. I couldn't hear that whole match out of my right ear. <laughs> so I was also so, going to, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I had a question for you, but you first. It's your show. Oh, okay. Um, how did you build your persona? My persona, and this may seem um, kind of weird, but my, I didn't really, you know, you're in, in life, especially in wrestling, the best people in wrestling, the best gimmicks in wrestling is somebody's real self turned up to 100. That's the most believable ones. Because you can tell that they're not acting. Um, I say, I tell people all the time, you know, when they say, what's with this new side of Tony Snow? You didn't used to act like this when you were a commentator. This isn't an act, okay? This is me. This is how I feel. The act was the last five years of my career when I had to pretend like I actually liked these mouth-breathing food stampers these entitled fans who think that just because they paid a few dollars at the door means that they get a picture with me for free. No, no. I, if, if my time is valuable, so anything that takes away my time from what I want to do, you're going to pay for, even if it's five seconds for a picture. 
Um, so honestly, wrestling has just given me the freedom to say the things I've been wanting to say for the last 42 years of my life. You know, I, I, this is stuff when I see someone that is overweight and they're sitting there with their drink resting on their stomach and they're eating nacho after donut after something else and they're yelling something at me you know what i see when i look at them i see me when i was 260 pounds and fat and overweight and it disgusts me and so that's where i came up with the sweat hogs thing like i looked like a freaking sweat hog and so when i see someone like that i i I literally wrestling is so great because I get to say how I feel and I get paid for it. The other day I was in uh, Tahlequah, Oklahoma. What a stupid name for a city, right? Anyway, so I was in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and it's great. The gym is called the Mark Homa Gym. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. The home of the Marks. This is a great place for Tony Snow to be managing. Anyway, um, as I was working, one of the stupid rednecks in the crowd mentioned something about my suit being too big. And I was like, okay, you want to have a conversation? Let's have a conversation, buddy. So I hopped out of the ring and I said, you know why my suit's too big? Because I used to be a big, fat, lazy sweat hog like you and your wife. But I decided I wanted to be better and I wanted to live and I wanted to look better and feel better and have a better life. So I lost weight. You should try to do the same. And he said, She's fat because she's pregnant, you blah, 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 and used an expletive. And I said, well, the good news for her is that she's not always going to be pregnant. But you, my friend, you're always going to be an ugly sweat hog. And then I got back to my work. So, um, like, seriously, like, I, this is, these are things that I've had to hold back. You know, like, I would never walk up to a grown man and slap him with a fistful of money. But guess what? Now I get to do it, and I get paid to do it, and I get to call them whatever I want to call them while I'm doing it. You know, it's great. It's 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 phenomenal. So, um, you know, EC3, he made a good point. I've talked to EC3 a few times. He's been somewhat of a mentor. I wouldn't say that he's a friend of mine. Like, I can't pick up the phone and dial EC3, but when I've seen him at shows, we've talked, and and what he said has made a lot of sense because – to, to do this business and especially to excel in this business, you can't be a normal person. You, you can't be all there, okay? There's got to be something to where you can hit that extra, that extra, that extra, that extra gear, I guess you can say, or you can crank it up to 10 because sometimes once you get up to 10, you're like, well, I cranked it up to 10, but I'm trying to get signed. So you know what? Let's crank it up even more. And the next thing you know, you're cranking it up to 100. And then before you know, you broke the knob off and you turned into Ric Flair. And, <laughs> you know, the guy who thinks that he really is that dude 24-7 and just walks around saying woo all the time. So it's a very, very thin line to balance and that's what Dilo has been helping me work on is balancing the balancing act between my actual life and my on-screen life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because I put out so much negativity into the world as my character that I go out of my way to turn it around in my personal life and put out positivity to make up for the negativity. Um, if you catch me in the mornings on my Facebook, I walk my doggy in the morning. She's like my best friend. And that's the one time that you can always be sure you're going to catch Tony Snow out of character. That's when I'm myself. That's when I'm just me. I'm dressed like me. I got a flannel shirt on and overalls and a cap. And I'm talking about the weather or football or whatever. I'll bring up wrestling every now and then. Um, but... You know, my trainer, Teddy Long, he taught me whatever you're going to do, do it looking like a rock star. So if I go to the store, I'm going at least like this or I'll throw a tie on with my vest. Um, I go in three piece suits to a lot of my errands because that's something that Teddy taught me. You have to do everything you can to set your part, set yourself apart, out, set yourself apart from everybody else. 
especially at shows. Um, like a manager doesn't need to be looking like someone from the crowd at a show. A manager needs to be looking different. You have to set yourself apart from everyone you're performing in front of. So I was going to ask, how does it make you feel when people boo you in the crowd? Oh, I love it because for bad guys, boos are cheers. And when I have something planned to say that I'm hoping gets a lot of heat and it does, oh, that makes my day because that means I have them right where I want them. Um, you know, I I put a whole lot of work into promos. Teddy makes me do five promos a day and send them to him. And he doesn't care what the promo's on, you know, whether it's on my this brand of hanger or my brass knuckles or or this cat toy. Like I have to send five promos a day to Teddy every day, seven days a week. And I realized that he was getting me ready to talk about anything whenever I need to talk about something. And I used that this past weekend because the company I worked for was three hours from where I'm at. And I don't have a car at the moment. And part of my deal with UWE was I get my rate, plus they send a car service to pick me up. And I didn't think they'd say yes, because that's an expensive ride. But they said yes. So uh, there was traffic on the way down and traffic on the way back. And I literally got to the show as the show was starting. Um, and the owner was like, okay, Tony, you're about to go do a promo, just cover this. And I was like, you, you got it. Yes, sir. And if you watch the footage, I walk out with my guy. I had literally walked in the venue. The owner's talking to me as I'm walking to the curtain. And then we walk out the curtain and I went to the ring and cut a promo and I had everyone there hating me because, and that's my job. And I'm really good at it. I've always been good at making people get or getting people getting under people's skin. Um, but my whole thing is this, Tori, when it comes down to it, everybody in this world has a choice. Um, and everyone in this world takes shortcuts, whether they admit to it or not. I have a company that I run called Snowman Enterprises, and that's the blanket company for all of my clients over all the companies I work for. MPX, Heart of Texas, UWE, Texoma, all that. It's Snowman Enterprises. Los Rios at MPX falls under Snowman Enterprises. Um, do we take shortcuts? Right, we do. Why? Because as Jesse Ventura said, Win if you can, lose if you must, but always cheat. The difference is when I cheat and when I take my shortcuts, I have the intestinal fortitude. And for those of you stupid sweat hogs out there that need a translation, that means I have the guts to do my shortcutting and my cheating in front of everybody. Like, think, look at your cell phone, AT&T. Tell me they don't take tax breaks sometimes every year. Look at the company you work for. Tell me they don't do something sly to save a little money here or there, even if it's just a small company. But the difference between me and them is I have the courage to do it in front of everybody because it doesn't matter if they see me. There's only one person who it matters if they see me, and that's the referee. And if the referee didn't see me, then guess what, Tori? It didn't happen. <laughs> If the referee doesn't see it, it didn't happen. Just like at Extravis Slams of last year, when the guy I was managing, the heavyweight champion Dutch Hagen, when Mr. Anderson went to suplex him in the ring and I tripped his foot up and then held his leg down and I tucked under the apron so the ref couldn't see me, 100% legal. You know why? Because the ref didn't see it. So guess what, guys? It didn't happen. And still, heavyweight champion Dutch Hagen. You're welcome. So would you ever be a baby face? No, I could never. There's no way. I've tried, and it just doesn't. And when I say I've tried, I've just tried, you know, just cutting baby face promos and stuff. And I just, I can't. I can't. Um, I think the most I could ever be is a tweener. Kind of like a, like the Punisher, like Frank Castle. You know, like 
my guys might have to take out some bad guys every now and then, but it's not because we want the fans to cheer for us. I don't care about the fans because I get paid the same amount of money every show, whether there's one fan or a hundred thousand. So I could care less about them. The only fans I care about are my fans, the fans that choose me and my guys. And if you want to cheer for me and my guys, then I guarantee you I'm going to do everything in my power to secure every championship I can. Just like this past Wednesday when my gift from, you know, my good friend, the Taskmaster, helped Kari Jai Wright win the Texoma Dynasty title from Tommy Prince. And that title meant the world to Tommy Prince. You know why? Because Ross and Marshall Von Erich, they presented it to him when he won a tournament. But guess what? We just took it right away from him, just like I told him we would for the past six months. He's just been ducking us that whole time. But that match is live on YouTube under Texoma Pro Wrestling. You can catch my work at MPX um, on YouTube under MPX Network. I haven't been there since the 30th of last month, though, because things hadn't been going the way that I had envisioned there. And so... I kind of fired all my guys. Um, <laughs> so I'm in a rebuilding stage at MPX right now. I made an example out of them and fired them all in the ring right after we lost. Um, but yeah, MPX is fun. You can catch, I've been there the whole last year. So you can catch the whole lead up and see for yourself. I didn't get any joy out of it. I love these guys. I spent 11 months flying them up from Cabo and doing El Jefe stuff with them. But I demand results. And when I started there, all I told my guys, guys, all that matters to me is gold, championships, titles. That is how a manager is remembered. Because think of it, Tori, if you watch a match, any given wrestling match, especially on TV, now if you're live, You can see and interact with the manager a little more. But when you're on TV, a manager usually only gets one to two times per match that he's on camera, if that. And so you got to make those memorable. So I don't have the in-ring moments that all these wrestlers have that can help build their resume. So what does a manager have to do? They have to secure championships so that we have a visual representation of our accomplishments in the sport. So what do you think is the best part of the job and the worst part of the job? Worst part of the job is traveling, 100%. I hate it. Um, I was a DJ for 25 years, and I was the dude that drove most of the time with all the artists I worked with. And then I transitioned over to wrestling, and... It's just as much try, uh, driving, if not more. Um, tomorrow, I'm getting on a plane at 3:30, and I'm getting into uh, I'm getting into DFW around nine, and then I got um, Friday. I got this thing with the Cincinnati Reds, my favorite team. Um, they invited me out for their game against the Rangers because they only have one one series with them in Texas this year. So I'm going to be at the Reds game in my three piece red suit, you know, um, as a guest. And then uh, Saturday, I've got some other plans in Dallas that, um, that we're not going to speak of yet uh, because the walls have ears. And I like to, I like to keep, uh, I like to move in silence. Like Lil Wayne said, real G's move in silence like lasagna. So you make your movements in silence and then people get to see the fruits of your labor afterwards. I will tell you this, though, when I come back to MPX, um, I have someone that I've been training with and working with over the past year, and I was waiting for a time to bring them to MPX. I always kept saying my enforcers on the way, my enforcers on the way. Well, everybody thought that my enforcer was Ojo Camacho. Well, here's news for you. It wasn't him. Ocho Camacho was just a very big guy that worked for me. My enforcer still down in Mexico um, has been training this whole time. And whenever I find the time is right, whenever I decide the time is right, I'll return to Metroplex Wrestling and I'll bring my enforcer with me. And um, I can't say who they are, but I will tell you that they are a 17-time world champion. 
and uh, I'm about to secure number 18. Wow, that's very so, exciting. Stay, stay tuned for that one. <laughs> so tell us about some of the talent that you're currently working with. Talent that I'm currently working with uh, right now up in um, up in UWE in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. I just started managing there. I started out commentating there. They wanted me to manage, and I said, I'll tell you what, guys. Let me do commentary for a few months and scout the locker room, and then if I see someone that I want to work with, then I can come back and manage. And we ended up doing that early, um, earlier than we anticipated. So I've got a tag team there. Um, and like I said, I was a huge WCW kid. So my tag team at UWE, and I did this all with his blessing. I reached out to him myself. My tag team at UWE is the new American Males. Uh, the American Males were, were uh, Marcus Alexander Bagwell and Scotty Riggs in WCW. So I reached out to Buff. And I said, you know, you guys were baby faces. We're going to be heels. That's the only difference. And he loved it. And he's like, man, we always wanted to be heels anyway. Yeah, go for it. That's great. And he sent me their old WCW theme music and everything. So that's going to be fun. Um, and then in Texoma Pro Wrestling, I manage uh, the current Dynasty champion, Kari Jai Wright. I also manage the Gatekeeper, who's the NCWO World Champion. Um, at Heart of Texas, I'm about to debut, so I don't know yet who I'm going to be working with. Uh, the owner there likes to keep creative close to his chest, so I won't know until I show up, probably. And then uh, at Texoma, uh, at, uh, I'm sorry, at MPX, I had uh, Los Rios del Inferno, which was Carlos Diaz, Ocho Camacho, um, Martin for now and Dylan Smasher, and that was fun. And then I've also managed a few other people in one-offs, like Montego Sica, uh, my time at WFC, where I managed Dutch Hagen and um, The Shining. Um, and then coming up, I'm, I'm going to have opportunity to work with Brian Cage and Lance Archer here in, in the next couple of months. So, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm having fun. I'm working with current guys and, mentored by my heroes from when I was a child. I'm, I'm having a blast, man. It's cool that you mentioned that because Buck Bagwell actually does one of my intros on my channel. And, I know. Yeah, and I can't believe you're going to work with Lance Archer. That's awesome. Yeah, it's going to be in uh, Ardmore, Oklahoma on May the 4th if you guys want to make it down. Um, but yeah, it's going to be... Um, it's gonna be something. If they're they're gonna, from what I heard, they're gonna be tagging Lance Archer and Brian Cage are gonna be tagging, and I'm gonna be, yeah, that's gonna be fun. It's gonna be a big tag team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Reinforce the ring that night, please, guys. <laughs> I won't be able to make it because my graduation's that day, but be sure and tell. Oh, it is that yeah. day. Yes. Oh man, yeah. Oh man, you're graduating on Star Wars day though. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I was going to have that. Yeah, for sure. But I was going to say, do you have any wrestlers and managers that you think definitely inspired your character? Um, yeah. Managers inspired my character, inspired how I act. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, there's a lot of Teddy Long there because... You know, I, I do a lot of the stuff that Teddy did when he managed Doom and he was a heel manager. Just this past Saturday, I used one of Teddy's moves to get my brass knucks to my guy. Um, there's a guy who was the heel manager at MPX for years named Jamie Aller. Um, and, you know, you can see his fingerprints all over my career because he's been a big mentor to me. And then... Through James Beard, I've learned a lot of Gary Hart stuff because I'm a huge Gary Hart fan, Playboy Gary Hart. He was a manager and the booker for World Class, um, and James Beard was one of his best friends. So whenever I see James, I'm always bugging him for some Gary Hart stuff. What can I do? What should I do here? What, you know, what would Gary do type stuff? And uh, and so yeah, it was. It was funny the other day someone mentioned uh, on a podcast I was listening to my name got brought up and that was kind of crazy 
And someone said that I'm kind of like Bobby Heenan and Gary Hart combined. And I was like, man, that's quite a compliment. Okay, um, I can just quit now. Because, you know, those are two of my my heroes there. Um, you know, Bobby Heenan's the GOAT. Everyone aspires to be him. Um, the thing about Bobby Heenan, though, is he had a big advantage that a lot of us don't have. He was He was a trained wrestler first. So he actually wrestled in the AWA and a lot. So a lot of those crazy bumps that Bobby Heenan took, it wasn't the first time he took it. And he could take wrestler bumps. You know, he would have people throw him over the top rope and stuff like that because he was a wrestler. And that's normal and common for them. Um, So, yeah. And then then there's always Jim Cornette. You got to give it up to Corny. You know, my last show at uh, my last show at WFC, I got Johnny Lightning to turn on Dynamite. Um, and he joined up with my faction and I came out dressed exactly like Jim Cornette in his Smoky Mountain days. And I brought out Johnny Lightning dressed exactly like Ric Flair as the WFC prime champion. And then he turned his back on me and they both knocked me out at the end of the match. But, uh, started good though. And I looked good while they did it. <laughs> I'm going to try to keep this under an hour, so I'm going to ask you one more question. Is there okay. anything that you would like to plug? And bonus question, I guess. I guess that's two questions. But what do you suggest for anybody that wants to get into the business? Um, if you want to get into the business, as far as talent being on TV, whether it's a manager, ring announcer, wrestler, whatever get trained by a renowned trainer and when i say that i say vet your trainer that you're going to go get trained by if they're not well known up where i'm at in oklahoma there's a lot of places you can go get trained to wrestle but that's not to say that you're going to get trained the right way uh because there's a lot of people that open wrestling schools that shouldn't be training people to wrestle. And I'm not trying to be mean. It's just the truth. You've got guys that have been doing this for six and seven years that are out there trying to train people. Um, if you're down for traveling to do it, OVW, Al Snow, Uncle Al, as he has me call him, um, they have a training school and they have the first ever, and Al worked for three years to do this, They have the first ever fully accredited trade school for pro wrestling. Like when you graduate from the OVW Academy, you get a diploma. Like it's a fully accredited trade school. You can get financial aid through um, the government and everything. Whereas every other training school out there is just a guy with a ring who is training people. Now, not to say that's bad. That's what uh, down in, San Antonio, Dog Pound Championship Wrestling, Rodney Mack and Jazz. They have a ring and a gym, and they train people, and they're legends, and they teach them how to do things right. If you're in DFW, there's the um, DFW All-Pro Academy. If you're in Oklahoma, there's the Texoma Pro Academy uh, with D'Lo Brown as the head trainer. There's lots of places you can get trained. So that's the first thing is get a good trainer. Um and I've really plugged everything I want to plug, you know, uh, D- DJ Tony Snow for my music. You know, I still got my music up on Bandcamp and stuff. It's always going to be there because music's always going to be a part of my life. Um, but then the companies I work for, Texoma Pro, uh, MPX, Heart of Texas, you can check all of them out on YouTube. So what's your favorite music then? Um... Honestly, and this may seem weird. I'm sorry. I'm getting my uh, my AC adapter so that my laptop doesn't die on me. Um, I was a I was a hip hop DJ for my entire career, and I worked with mostly Texas artists. Um, but my favorite music ever is i just i love rock and roll and uh like alternative stuff like that my my favorite band ever is a band from the 90s called third eye blind i know their original bass player um i'm a huge kiss fan i i've seen kiss like 13 times i just loved all the production and the stage show atmosphere of a kiss show 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's weird because I was a hip hop DJ, but I always liked classic rock and alternative and stuff like that. That was my gig. We love rock music. Yeah, that's right. Really- oh man. Yeah, dude. When I when I uh, when I used to do karaoke, I would always uh, do Strutter or God of Thunder or something like that. I just I'm a huge Kiss fan. I love classic rock. So thank you for being on my show. I have a question for you, Latori. Okay. Mhm. Because I I see your merch all over the place. I've seen Rod Price wearing it and some other people wearing it. And so my question for Tori is. What is your first wrestling memory? What, what? How did you get into wrestling? Because I mean, you look at you. You're you're a premier broadcast journalist and a professional sport here. I want to know how you got your start. Like, what made you want to do this? Well, growing up, my dad. I mean, during his childhood, was obsessed with wrestling. So of course, he brought it into my childhood as well. So then I love I, how you rolled your eyes. I love how you rolled your eyes like my dad, you know, he <laughs> he brought it in as him. <laughs> but he uh you missed it, Dad. She did a definite eye roll when she said that. She's like, my dad. Well, I'll tell you this. I share a lot of similarities of your childhood with mine. Even the same wrestling companies that we watched. So very cool. And he has autism. Yep. So there you go. I'm telling you, man, were we separated at birth, Matt? <laughs> Matt. No, there's something I don't know about. You do look a lot like me. I'm a little better looking, though. A little <laughs> slightly. <laughs> Matt can try harder to look, yeah. more, look more like you. Yeah. We'll get him a three-piece suit. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's Teddy's quote. Everything you do, do it looking like a rock star. Um, before I get off here, I'll tell y'all uh, a quick little Teddy story that y'all might like. Um, t- <laughs> Teddy's Teddy was trained by Kevin Sullivan. That's how I got these uh, these nugs. Kevin Sullivan gave me these. He was trained by Kevin Sullivan and Eddie Gilbert. But Dusty Rhodes gave him his first job. And Dusty would have Teddy sit in on their creative meetings. Dusty loved Teddy. And he would constantly be messing with him. And one day they were in the catering line waiting to eat. And Dusty comes up to Teddy. And if Dusty liked you, he would say your whole name. He walked up, Teddy Long. Hey, Teddy Long, come here, baby. Come here, look at this, Teddy. And Teddy's like, Dusty, what's up? He's like, Teddy Long, you know what that Stephanie McMahon did to me this weekend? She called me on a Saturday, and I had to tell her, Stephanie, it's the weekend, baby. Weekend, that means the week is over. The week's over, baby. Call me on Monday, Teddy Long. (laughs) And just just sitting there hearing all these stories from him about Dusty and hearing stories from from Kevin Sullivan about who used these brass knuckles and the pay-per-view they were on. And and I worked at a convention with Teddy last year and everyone was in this room, like Lex Luger, Bret Hart, you know, and they're coming up saying hi to Teddy and introducing themselves to me, you know, and Brett's like shaking my hand. Hi, I'm Brett. And I'm like, I I know who you are. <laughs> like you, you're working, so you try not to get starstruck. But when these are the people that made your childhood awesome, you know, it's kind of hard. Like Arn Anderson was there and I was a WCW kid. They had all the horsemen there. Like it was like, man, it's Barry Windham right there. Like, right. I could reach out and touch Barry Windham. Like, what what am I doing here, man? You know what I'm doing? I'm enjoying every second of it, Tori. Just like I enjoyed every second of this podcast with you. Thank you. Well, I was going to say to my audience, go watch Tony Snow's wrestling stuff that he's plugged because he's great and you won't regret it. Thank you for watching. Like, comment, share, subscribe, and go in the description to check out my merch tour and my other channels. Bye. 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 Make sure you subscribe or you're a sweat hog. Hey there, I am Buff and I am the stuff. I want to welcome you to Tory Talks Wrestling. You better like, comment, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to buy some of her merchandise or I will have to give you the blockbuster. Tory's show is just too sweet.
and Tori now has merch. Go check it out at bonfire.com. Link in the description and under the About tab. Bye!